Enjoy 24, episode 67. Today we had uh, Aaron Johnstone back on the podcast the second time around. Aaron is a therapist, a clinical counselor, and today we talked about trauma, anxiety, uh, depression, how to deal with those traumas and how to live with them and how to accept them. You know, it was certainly a really educational episode and I learned a lot of things. I, I'm sure you will as well. So uh, tune in. Enjoy your 24, episode 67, Aaron Johnstone. Enjoy. Peace. Fuck. I love my therapist, man. What do you love about him? Um, he keeps it honest with me. Mm-hmm. He really does. I think he, because I had a therapist before him, and he was bad. He was bad <laughs> yeah. He was not good. You know, therapy is like anything else. There's good, bad, and in between, and so... Sometimes people go to therapy and have a bad experience and then they go, oh, therapy's stupid or it doesn't work or whatever. Right. But if you find the right person, it can be awesome. Yeah. I mean, he works for me, right? I yeah. think the one thing he told me at the very first day, he said, um, after three sessions, if you're not feeling any better or you're not feeling anything at all, I'm not the therapist for you. Perfect. Yeah. He said that to me. Yeah, no. So yeah. is that what you say? Is that like protocol to say that? Uh, no, it's not protocol, but... I don't like. I'm in a place where I don't. I don't feel as though I need to sell myself. Right, therapy is fascinating. I love it for so many different reasons. But someone comes in and they pay you a shitload of money of their hard-earned money just to have a conversation about their life, and at the end of it, you either feel as though that was worth your money and time, or you don't. Sort of thing. And so mm-hmm. my attitude is, if you come here. At the end, you're going, fuck, I wish I didn't spend that money on that. Then it's obviously something's mm. not working. Yeah. But when therapy's good, it's it's self-evident that it's worth it. Right. Yeah. Is it okay to feel kind of worse after therapy and yes. then start feel better yeah, after yeah. a few days? Yeah, definitely. You start opening up something you've been repressing for the last 20 years. Right. You might leave it and feel unstable or anxious or sad or something like that. Yeah. So that happens all the time. Here's something you might find interesting. So I work with men and women. I was talking to a client about this recently. My observation is men are so fucking repressed emotionally compared to women, right? So men are, they come in and it's like something's happened to them, a breakup or a death or something, and they're so goddamn repressed. There's something in them. And I think it's, it's automatic. I think they learn it at a young age. It's pushing down their emotions, right? And the more intensely you push down your emotions, the more intense your symptoms are. So panic attacks pop up, depression pops up, addictive compulsive behavior pops up. Mm. But it's fascinating to watch someone come in and start to talk about their childhood or their dad or their mom or something like that. And they've never talked about it. It's just off, it's just been off limits. Mm. And so they start to talk about it and their body squirms. They get uncomfortable. There's something in them going, danger, danger. We don't do, do this. Don't talk. You know, push it down. Is it more around family where men in particular suppress it? Is it is it yeah. around that? Yeah. I, so I think women do that as well sort of thing. But I think... Well, our families are our mo- first people we attach to, right? Attachment's so important to your psyche. And so the damage that dysfunctional relationships with our parents or our family do are, are pretty deep, right? And so people are pushing that down or don't want to think about it, don't want to talk about it, you know, because it feels wrong or something like that. It feels like they're breaking a rule to talk about mm. How shitty their mom was. Or they're, yeah, they're going against their family. Yeah. They're... And what's, people can have completely contradictory feelings at the same time. So you can absolutely love your mom and at the same time you can resent her. Or you can, yeah, you can resent her for the ways in which she fell short. So the two don't cancel each other out. Both are valid or both are true. And so it comes time where people are in therapy and it comes time to talk about, oh, well, the way your mom treated you when you were a kid, right? Mm. But you love her. And so you start to talk about that and there's something that comes up and you goes, what are you doing? You're going to shit talk your mom, Mm. you know? And so people start to feel guilty or anxious. And so they don't go into it or they stick a little toe in it and, and run back. Right. Mm. But with those feelings, if you don't put language to them, if you don't talk about them, you don't process them. And so it's like that energy or that emotion stays alive in you. Yeah. You know, I, um, you might've seen a video I did. 
I said, men take longer to get over a breakup than women. Did you see that one? I did. And there's tons of exceptions to that. I don't even know if that's true. That's just my observation, my clients, right? And the reason I said that is because they don't talk about it. And so what human beings do is we talk about difficult things. And in doing that, we're conceptualizing, we're understanding, and we're working through the raw emotion of that experience. But if you don't talk about it, it just it builds up in you, and then something shuts down, and you become depressed. I hear you. Yeah. That's fair, man, because one of the things, personally for me, growing up, like I, I, I looked up to my mom a lot. Mm-hmm. I, I never... Th- I thought she was, you know, the smartest person in the world. She had everything figured out. Anything she did or said was completely right. Yeah. So it's hard for me to, like, go back and, like, even when I talk to my therapist about, like, how I was raised and, like, my living environment back home. Yeah. It's hard for me to, like, like you said, like, shit talk my mom. Basically, hear my therapist tell me that my mom was wrong in the way Mm -hmm. she did certain things and, Mm -hmm. and... and handled some things while she was raising me. And like, as I'm getting older too now, dude, I, I'm starting to notice it. Like, damn mom, like I love you to death. You're, you're my everything. You're my best friend, but you kind of messed up in the way that you Mm -hmm. induced anxiety in me every single day in different ways that I had no idea. And I just thought as a kid growing up, obviously I thought that was just like the way parents were and like how yeah. I was supposed, that was the right way. Yeah. Well, you grow up in a certain environment and it becomes your norm. So what you see later in life, which is so fascinating is people attach to what's familiar, right? And so people will find themselves in toxic, unhealthy relationships. And it's like, why? Because some aspect of it is familiar to them. And so it feels, I don't want to say right, but it, it's what they know. And so they gravitate towards that sort of thing. Wow. Yeah. But it's interesting listening to you because you said at the start, I want to know if I've changed since we last spoke. Last time I spoke to you, you were saying, uh, I get anxious. There's no reason for it. It just happens. It's completely random sort of thing. And now you're talking about your mom and your childhood. And it seems like you've got a more nuanced yeah, understanding man. of that. Not to say it's all no, on that, I mean, but you're talking oh, about it differently. I was actually, so I was on the drive here, I was listening to our episode. Oh, yeah. And a lot of, at a lot of the points that we were talking about, I'm starting to, I'm, I have, I kind of have the answers for it now. Cool. So one of the things, and um, I don't know if you can attest to this and you have your thoughts on it, but like when I do feel anxious now and it could be just me watching TV. Like that's the example I gave mm-hmm. last episode. Yeah, yeah, just I remember. TV and I get it. I get anxious. Yeah, I really dig down and unpack what happened to me as a child. Because one thing I'm like starting to realize, man, and I've opened up, and it took me a year to open up to my therapist about this, mm-hmm. is that I had some family trauma as yeah. a kid. Yeah, right. Like it wasn't, and that's the thing. For for the longest time, I kept. Um, shrugging it off because it wasn't one of these extreme cases where i was sexually abused yeah. or physically abused yeah. or i had a drunk dad it's called complex I, trauma com, you yeah. know and i didn't i didn't have that so i always undermined my trauma yeah a little bit of yelling screaming seeing mom cry yeah auntie and mom being combative third party uncle having issues with his life and how it's affecting my mom and how she is feeling. And I'm seeing that. Yeah. I used to, dude, I used to, these things really activated me. Like these things gave me so much anxiety and all my life I've been undermining because it doesn't fall in the category of sexual abuse, physical abuse. So how old are you? 28 now. 28. So what happens is the 28 year old Mo looks back at what happened at, when you were 10. So we look back at these negative traumatic experiences as a kid and we see them through our adult eyes and we go, oh yeah, that was a bit fucked up, but whatever, you know, it's not like I was raped or abused. It's not that big of a deal. And we lose touch with what it was like to be 10. So the 10 year old, 10 year old Mo had a different experience of that than 28 year old Mo, Mo looking back in hindsight, right? And I believe in this term called the inner child. And so when trauma happens to us, we get stuck there. You grow up, you evolve, you mature, you become 28. It's not like you're a child anymore. But emotionally, in some aspect, 
there's still a 10-year-old boy in there. And you can tell he's in there because he gets triggered by certain things and he reacts in an intense way that doesn't match the situation for an adult. Mm-hmm. I'll give you an example. So I have this client and uh, she she she's in a relationship and any time her boyfriend is a bit distant or doesn't text back in an hour, she freaks out. And she she assure or he assures her that he's not going to leave her. It's just I'm tired from work or I wasn't looking at my phone. And she has no reason to think that that he's going to leave her. Um, but yet in these moments she freaks out. And I ask her, I say, in those moments, how old do you feel? Just answer intuitively. Don't think. She immediately goes ten. I feel ten years old. Okay, so where did that number come from? Where, why ten? I say, what happened when you were ten? She goes, my parents got divorced. Okay, and so at 10 years old, her dad has to leave. And so she has an experience where the man who loves her all of a su- sudden abandons her, out of no- seemingly out of nowhere, because she's 10. She doesn't understand the dynamics of a failing marriage or divorce or these sorts of things. And so there's a 10-year-old girl in there. Okay, and now she's 25 or something, and her boyfriend says, I love you, I'm not going to leave you. And logically, she, she believes that to be true. But when he doesn't respond in an hour or when he comes home and doesn't want to snuggle on the couch, that 10-year-old girl that's still in there somewhere gets activated and starts freaking out, right? You get what I'm saying? Of course. So it's interesting. If you ask, you go, how old do you feel? She immediately goes 10. Doesn't know where that answer comes from. I go, what happened when you're 10? Parents got divorced. And so you can see how we get trapped in experiences emotionally. Mm. Yeah. Men don't like that, by the way. Women have a way easier time accepting that. Men don't like to acknowledge that there's a scared little boy in there. It doesn't fit with their identity or mm-hmm. who they want to be. No. Yeah. It took me a while, dude, to tell my therapist that I did endure a lot of a, f- a lot of bullying in elementary. Mm-hmm. So, why do you think, uh, without judging yourself, why do you think it took you so long? What is it that was resisting? Something about bullying, I've always thought of it as very, um, like, almost embarrassing. To yeah, talk about. it's degrading. Yeah. I, I did go through a really rough patch in elementary, and it took me about a year and a half to finally open up to my therapist about that. And it was one of those things where, even in therapy, like, even in our sessions, it was, it was in my mind, I really wanted to say it was at the tip of my tongue, but I... I couldn't say, Mm -hmm. even saying it right now, Mm -hmm. people listening, it's just like this like cloud of judgment that's going to go over me. Like, oh, you got bullied. You You, weren't the cool kid. Yeah, you weren't the The cool. The girls didn't like you. you, Girls didn't like me. I wasn't, yeah. And throughout high school, I was way better. Like I wasn't really getting bullied, but I also wasn't like the coolest Mm -hmm. kid, right? Like I had friends, people didn't really like dislike me, but it was just kind of like. Well, people discredit, uh. Bullying's intense, and bullying really affects people, right? But again, it happens at a young age, and then we grow up, and we think, oh, it's just some bullying sort of thing. But it it gets to people. So so how old were you when that happened? I was around 11, 12, Okay, so let's say say 11. Here's a way to frame it, okay? Uh, The 11-year-old boy didn't want to open up in therapy. Okay, so 28-year-old Mo, that's, he was okay with doing it. But there's an 11-year-old in there, and it's on the tip of your tongue, and you at 28 are about to go into it and reflect on it and learn from it in therapy. But that 11-year-old boy is going, let's not do this. Let's not do this. And so the idea is you need to go back and support that part of yourself in a way that it needed at, that, at 11 years old but didn't get. Okay. Am I making sense? 100%. But what people always do, or almost always do, so that, let's say you have a little boy in there, your inner child, is they treat that part of themselves the way it got treated. And they reinforce the very issue they're struggling with, right? And so you're going, no, no, that's embarrassing. Don't talk. I'm embarrassed of you. People didn't like you. No, don't talk about it. Don't even talk about it in therapy. You're pathetic. That's weak, right? And so you're bullying that 11-year-old boy. And you're reinforcing the issue. Mm. And so the idea is you have to turn yourself into the loving father or the cool older brother or whatever 
some sort of support system that it didn't have mm. and say, we can talk about you. There's nothing to be embarrassed about, even if that boy doesn't believe it. Right. And so you split from it. You don't abandon it. You don't repress it, but you don't become identified with it. You don't become the 11 year old boy. You become like what you're doing with these kids in East Van to yourself. Mm. What do you think of that? agree 100 mm -hmm. percent. i agree because yeah like the part of me that never really wanted to talk about it was just like this weird embarrassing cloud of judgment that was over me it was because i felt like if i were to say it if i was to vocalize it it's that 11 year old boy talking about it mm -hmm. during that time mm -hmm. so what did he and if, if you don't want to talk about this by the way or what feel free to change the topic, but if I were your therapist, mm. I'd, I'd ask, so what did that 11-year-old boy do with that experience? You get bullied. What conclusions does he draw up on himself? Like, what are the beliefs that start to form? Yeah, I actually, we, I did talk about it. It's one of those things. I remember it was, I would leave, I would come back home from school and think, what did I do wrong? Yeah. Why am I different? Yeah. Did I, what did I say that was completely off, offside this whole day? Like, what... I, I go throughout my I go through my whole day as soon as I get to school, lunchtime, math class, recess, and then after school. Like I really dissect the whole day and think to myself, what did I say wrong yeah. that made these people, my peers, look at me differently? And you can see how that that right there can manifest into some form of social anxiety or generalized anxiety. So you get this part that that goes that feels a shame. Goes, what's wrong with me? People don't like don't like me. I must be doing something wrong. Otherwise, why would they be doing this? Okay, what did I say? How did I look? Was my hair like this? And this part that starts to worry or becomes hyper. I don't know if this applies to you, by the way, but this is common. Yeah, it it becomes hyper self conscious forms, right? And again, what people usually do is they hate in adult life. They hate that part. Say, so why the fuck am I like this? What the fuck do I care? Sort of thing. And so they hate a part of themselves. But when you frame it as, that's the best strategy 11-year-old boy who didn't feel good about himself could come up with to try to protect himself from shame. That's a different thing, right? And so you can form a healthier relationship with that part of your psyche, with that defense mechanism or whatever you want to call it. Mm. And, and when you're not busy hating it and repressing it and trying to destroy it, you can start to detach from it. And then it's here. It's still a part of you, but it doesn't have its grip on you, mm. right? Like coming here today, I was a little bit anxious. Cameras are going, whatnot. It's not true. And even as we're having this conversation, there's a little part of me that's aware that this is being filmed and people are going to see it. And am I going to look like an asshole? Am I going to look really smart or whatever, right? So that's part of my psyche, but... It's just hanging out right here as opposed to consuming me. I'm not identified with it. Mm. So it can happen without me. See, this is where the words kind of fizzle out. It's hard to talk about these things because it's all invisible stuff happening inside of us. So it's right. hard to find language. But what, how, do you, how do you get to that point? Do I don't you, know. <laughs> you don't know? Yeah. I don't know. For me, my job really helped. So I used to be a teacher. I loved it. But I felt... Um, and this is nothing against teaching whatsoever, just for me personally. I felt as though I wasn't living up to my potential, whatever that word means. I just had a sense that, not even better, that I could do something different. Because, again, I really don't want to demean teaching. Some of the most impressive people I've ever met in my life were the teachers I worked with. But for me, I didn't really give a shit about the job. I loved working with the kids. I was really good at that, too. I was a terrible teacher in terms of the curriculum, but I was great at working with the kids. And uh, so I just had this gnawing sense I need to be doing something different. Mm. And then once I listened to that, it became pretty easy, to be honest. Also part of it is just getting older. Right. I'm 30. I'm 34 now. I don't really it's go crazy. to, like, clubs yeah. or anything like that. So I'm not in situations where I'm really being evaluated by, you know, yeah. that kind of social game. It's cool, dude. Like, the last episode we did, we, we talked about our ages. You were 33. I was 27. Mm -hmm. Now like, you're older. It's pretty pretty cool because like, yeah it was um a lot of things we talked about on the last episode of just um you know settling down and getting older and like finding value in different things and 
I'm really starting to feel it now where mm -hmm. I'm at a point in my life where going out and just doing things that like a 24, 25 year old would do or just, yeah. it, it absolutely does nothing. No, me. no. Nothing. Yeah. It, it, it actually makes me feel worse. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so I think you're right on track. That's where you want to be. And that's not like, I think early on, early in your twenties and mid twenties, men in particular, um, are, are focused on pleasure. They prioritize pleasure, getting drunk, getting high, getting laid, these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me is that's just the way it is. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Obviously, there could be. But that seems to be what men in their earlier mid-20s, especially early 20s, that's part of their development. And then I think what you want is as you get older, 28, 29, 30, I think you want to start to outgrow that. And the only way you you know you've outgrown that is if you go do those things and you sit around going, this is fucking stupid. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be here yeah. sort of thing. And so what happens is pleasure no longer does the trick. You need responsibility. You need something more meaningful, something with more substance mm -hmm. to it, right? And I see that. I work with a lot of men who I'd say are in their late 20s and they're still acting like they're 24 and they come in and what am I trying to say? What are they holding on to when they're, uh, is, it there, is it something they're holding on to or are they afraid to jump out of that stage of I their life? I don't know. I would say it differs reason? from each. Pro I think people resist changing, especially their routines and patterns. And I think we feel the change before we know that it's time to change, if that makes sense. And so we feel we're at a club and it's 2 a.m. or whatever, and, you're, and you, you feel eh, this, this isn't working anymore. This isn't where I want to be before you intellectually understand, oh, I'm getting older and I've outgrown this, these sorts. Of, it's like our conscious mind catches up right. later. That happens in relationships, too. You start to feel distant. You start to feel like you want it, something like that. There, there, there's, there's two people are growing apart. They don't know it yet. Or they might just be starting to know it, yeah. right? Their mind will get there. You know, their mind will get to the conclusion that they don't want to be in this relationship. This person isn't right for them. But they feel it first. Right. Yeah. Now, one thing I wanted to ask you about, and, like, you, you know, might not have the answer right now. And there's a lot of moving parts to this, mm -hmm. this uh, question. But how can someone value themselves to the point where they don't need that validation from anyone else, mm -hmm. right? Like what's, like, is it like from my experience, like the bullying and what I went through, is that, does that play a big part in the way I feel how I do now where I need, I need external and social validation from others to make me feel worthy of who I am. And without that, it, I just don't feel like I'm okay. So, so what like what's... there's this quote by this famous therapist, Carl Rogers. He said, "The curious paradox is, as soon as I accept myself just as I am, then I'm free to change." Okay, so just look at the question you just asked me. You said, "How can I get to a point where I can stop uh, caring what people think about? Where I don't need validation? I'm sick of needing fucking validation." Okay, so you just told me about that 11-year-old boy being bullied. Of course, after those experiences, there's going to be a part of you, not all of you, not your entire being, but there's going to be a part of you that really wants people to like him. I have the same part, by the way. So part of it's human nature, and then part of it is probably these experiences we've talked to you. And so you're saying, how can I get rid of that boy? He's pissing me off. I'm sick of him. So you're bullying the boy again. You're not accepting the boy who wasn't accepted at 11 years old. So I'd say, ironically, how you stop caring what people think about you is to accept and to support that there's a part of you that does care what people think about you. Right. If you can be okay with that, that part will calm down. And so is, what... Is go it, ahead. Is it, is it to... Ex accept that 11 year old boy like is it, it is it to look at my 11 year old self and say 
that boy wanted validation and and he's still a part of me and he's still in there somewhere and oh. we can't kick him out right we can't destroy him we don't want to anyways okay and i would say part of that has probably led you to doing this podcast and meeting these cool people and developing your skills right. and potentially becoming a therapist one day if you choose to right so part of that is the boy and so it's not this bad part. It's not this weakness. It's not this cancerous tumor that you need to rip out of you. Once I destroy that, then I'll be happy. Right. right? You need to genuinely accept that part of yourself. Right. And once you become okay with the fact that there's a part of you that cares what other people think, I assure you, you'll ironically stop caring what people think or you'll care less what people think of you. Am I so making acknowledge, sense? acknowledge the yeah. fact that you do you get, care about other yeah, people. Yeah, because when you what? start to accept and work with it, you don't become identified with that part. Mm. Like I said, I have a part of me that's in here hanging out today, thinking about how's this going to go? Am I going to get some good reels to post on Instagram from this? Okay, but I'm not identified with that part. I'm not saying that's me. I'm also not repressing it or denying that it exists. It's just hanging out right here. And so most of me is conscious and paying attention to you. Right. Yeah. So all I'm saying is you have this idea of who you want to be. I want to be a guy who doesn't give a shit about what people think sort of thing. Right. Okay. I, mean, I, I feel like everyone. Yeah, we all want do. To get there, I want to right? be a guy who doesn't need validation yeah. sort of thing. But that's not true. Or that's not uh, how you actually are. Most of you is probably like that. But then you got this part of you that was bullied and it does care what people think. I'm saying it's easier to, instead of trying to destroy that part and eliminate him, is to work with it and support support it. And then you'll get closer to becoming however it is you want. To. Right. Yeah. Even when you say it out loud, it feels weird. Cause what do you mean? What's weird about when you, not when a you say, question? When you say, oh, you know, the part of you, like with 11-year-old boy, when you were getting bullied, like it, it's a it's a fact. And even... Even... um. Even 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 though I am who I am today and I'm completely different than that mm-hmm. eleven year old boy, I think there's like that vulnerability of me putting it out there that once in my life I was mm-hmm. bullied and I wasn't, you know, the quote unquote cool guy that I am now. I mean, I don't even know if you know that's what people think of me, but it's just uh, I don't know. It's kind of. I have this, like, assumption in my head that people are going to be listening to this or watching this and be like, oh, what the fuck? Like, Mo was, like, this guy was bullied one day? Like, Uh during one day, during a time in his life, this guy, oh, so, and I I swear to God, bullying is connected to this, like, this, this, uh, this sense of, um, incompetence. Like, oh, you're bullied, you're a loser. It's the same with getting dumped. Yeah. People are ashamed of being dumped. Some They date someone, they fall in love, they go out, they hang out, they share who they are with someone, and then someone goes, nah, I'm good. I'd rather not have you in my life than have you. It's not, you know, there's more to it than that usually, but that's the essence of it. And so we have these experiences that make us feel worthless and ashamed. And um, it's you're projecting, you know the term projection? You're projecting onto, there's probably a couple people out there who are going to go, oh, you got bullied, haha, whatever, but... You know what I mean? It's weird. Like, it's such a weird thing. Like, I'm 28. That was damn near 20 years ago. And people are still going to, no matter how, like, let's say I become the most famous podcaster in the world. I have all these amazing guests on. I make all this money. Just the little glimpse of my life saying that I got bullied for three years when I was 11 there are gonna pe- there are going to be people watching and listening to that and be like, oh, Moe's. Like, they're just going to, like, automatically put me into this, like, into this bubble of, oh, he's a loser. Yeah, maybe. No matter what he's accomplished and what he is now. Yeah, Yeah, maybe. You know? I don't don't know uh, what it is. I I maybe You might, no, you might be right about that. You know, if you, there's endless different types of people out there, so they're going to respond differently, and a couple might respond that way. But to me, just hearing you talk, you can see the shame you feel towards yourself. Towards that part of you, Mm -hmm. right? And that's okay. That's just where you're at, okay? And there are places where I'm, you know, not where I want to be as well. 
but it comes back to you and and the way you feel about that part of you or about the fact that you were bullied at that age, right? So it always comes back to you. And don't judge yourself. Don't give yourself shit for, you know, wherever you're at along your, your journey in life, but just get curious about that and explore that. Mm. Ask yourself without it being a rhetorical question or without, you know, just a genuine question of why is it that I can't, why am I not comfortable with that? Not, you know, not why am I not comfortable with, I'm 28 years old, I was bullied when I was 11. Okay, and I still have these responses. There's still something in it doesn't fucking like that. You know, why is that? I'm not expecting you to have an answer right Mm. now, but it's just the attitude in which you explore these parts of yourself. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, But, you know. I don't know. It's, um, I love therapy. I find it fascinating. It's absolutely undeniable that every human being, we grow up in a certain environment, our family, our peers, okay, and that environment molds and shapes us, okay, and then we go forward and we, we become an adult and we're, st- we're affected by the environment in which we grew up and we're shaped in some way, right? It's undeniable. Everyone's in that same boat. My experiences and my environment are different than yours, right? And so what happens is sometimes, usually in our late 20s, we keep hitting our head against the same wall, right? We keep dating the same toxic partner who reminds us of our mom or dad. We keep, uh, you know, whatever, worrying too much about what people think about us. We keep uh, running away from the thing that makes us anxious. And after we've done that enough, after we've rammed our head against that wall enough, we stop and we go, wait a minute, something's going on here. Something other than my rational mind is steering the ship. I think it has something to do with my mom or my dad or getting bullied in school. And we look inwards and we start to explore ourselves and understand ourselves in a more nuanced, deeper way. Mm. Uh huh. Is that, does that just come with time, you think? I think Gen Z is way better at it than my generation. Really? You think Gen Z is better at it? Gen Z is flawed in a lot of ways. They're way more self-aware. I work with these 20-year-olds who are talking about their attachment style and their love language and all this stuff. I didn't know what an attachment style was until I was 28 and I went back to get my master's in counseling, right? And so I think younger kids are way more psychologically minded, mm. you know? More self-aware, yeah. more in tune with the with the, 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 the vocabulary. They, and the... Yeah, they, this, they've grown up with this language. Mm. They know, you know, so the attachment style example, they'll go, I have an anxious attachment style and it's playing out in my high school relationship sort right. of thing. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, none, no one I knew was talking like that. Dude, one thing I wanted to get into you with you, um, and I don't know if you, you know, have any thoughts on this or anything, but one thing that I've um, began to do and I've I've started to really notice is I've started to unfollow a lot of celebrities on Instagram, mm-hmm. especially Drake. Oh, yeah. Unfollow? Unfollow. Oh, okay. Because one of the things, and we kind of alluded to this in the last episode where, like, there's this, like, societal expectation of, like, where you need to be and what you need to have accomplished and what you have is, like, def- how it defines you is particularly for men. Mm-hmm. One thing that I think is not talked about enough, and it's extremely toxic in a lot of ways, is the people we look up to as men... And the celebrities that are just, like, more famous than anything. Like, ex- especially for Drake. Like, one of the things, you know, I was talking to with my friend. And he, I was like, yeah, I don't know, man. Like, whenever I look at Drake's posts or when he, you know, posts about his concert, his tour, or women, his mm-hmm. music, his accomplishments, it makes me feel incompetent in a way and inferior in many ways and he basically just told me like the thing with drake and i'm really like pointing out drake because he was the one that kind of um triggered this for me is like he's very unrelated like he makes it seem like he's very unrelatable yeah he's not relatable at all like it doesn't it just doesn't seem like he ever has a bad day it just doesn't seem like he has anything wrong going on i that is that is farthest from the truth right like he being that famous, having that much money, there's no way he, 
hasn't ha- doesn't have issues, doesn't have anxiety, yeah. doesn't have worries in his life, right? But he make he just makes it seem so. He just makes himself so unrelatable on Instagram, and I think, do you think that plays a big role in a lot of men's anxiety and depressions? Mm, well, this is what came to mind. And uh, I don't think it's going to answer your question. I'll say it anyways. So when I was a little boy, I looked up to Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. Okay. And then as I got a little bit older, I looked up to uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin. Oh, yeah. And then as I got a little bit older, I was a big rugby player in high school. And I I liked rugby and football guys, Ray Lewis, Tom Brady, these sorts of things. Oh, yeah. um, now I find myself admiring the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Okay. And so if I look at that, what what I'm drawn to is masculine men, but as I get older, I get a more nuanced role model, I would say. So Arnold Schwarzenegger's on steroids, but that's about as simplistic of as a male role model you can yeah, find. Yeah, it's like right? almost like 10-year-old so, boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess the football, yeah, exactly. And so Later on in life, I connected with the Red Hot Chili Peppers, my favorite band. And they're these interesting guys who were all heroin addicts, rock star lifestyle, girls, sex, drugs, rock and roll. Then they found spirituality. They became sober. And they have this amazing, at least I find, this amazing balance between masculine and feminine energy. So they're not just meatheads. They're not just bodybuilder types kind of thing, right? So uh, I don't really know where I'm going with this. But when you talk, when you're saying, I find myself on following Drake, I would say there was something in you that was drawn to him, okay, as a role model or someone that you looked to and said, I like what that guy's about or I could be something like th- something like that, right? right? And maybe you're outgrowing that. Or maybe you're looking aspects of him and he's only posting pictures with girls or whatever. And you're looking for something, a more realistic, sophisticated, a nuance. Right. I don't know. That's Yeah, I don't know what it is. No, you're completely right. Because he plays this role really well where he brands it of... You kind of look like him. Who, me? Yeah. No way. Well, not exactly like him. Oh, but, but I'm serious. You know, <laughs> we find... Really? We, yeah. we admire people who usually are somewhat remind us of... of something we could be or we look like or in some ass like that's oh, yeah. what happened to me and larry larry the, the guy the therapist you okay. had on larry walked in and i was in school to be a therapist and then this badass he was probably 75 at the time older confident therapist guy who was living the life i wanted walked in and i could feel my mind kind of attached to him and go oh learn from this guy listen to this guy right. sort of thing so he was but you know there was some similarity there or something in that that I could see myself in, even though I'm, I wasn't at but that point. Did you feel like you weren't as triggered as someone like me comparing myself to Drake? Because the fact of the matter is it's very, very difficult for me to ever yeah, yeah. get to the point of, course, of, of Drake's yeah. fame and yeah. money and all of that. Yeah. But with Larry, like I'm not saying Larry's like – He's you know, not I'm, not, I'm not downplaying yeah, 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 Larry, yeah, know, but like, it, it, it's more realistic yes. for you to be able to achieve what Larry yeah. has. Well, I'd say Drake on Instagram is triggering something that's in you, okay? And whether it's Drake that brings it up or an ex-girlfriend or a podcast that doesn't go well, right? That's in you. And so right. I'm not criticizing your decision to unfollow Drake. I, a couple years back, I unfollowed half the – because I'm just – I don't know these people. Why am I looking at this stuff sort of thing? So I right. made that decision too. But there's something in you that's unsettled, okay? And there's something in me that's unsettled in all of us. But there, And it it's, takes an Instagram post for that to be revealed to you. And so my question wouldn't be about Drake or not. It would be what, what's going on in you when you see a picture of Drake with some beautiful woman or driving some car. You want to know what it is? Your choice. We don't have to turn oh, this man. into your therapy session. But. <laughs> I, know, I know, but like, to be honest, like, you know, when Drake does post a video of hundreds of hundreds of girls throwing their bras at him. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds childish, but yeah, there is a part of me where I'm like, damn, I, I, I want that attention. So that's the word. It sounds childish and not to demean you, but remember the 11-year-old boy who nobody likes. Go, just about just entering puberty. 
Okay, when you develop and you start comparing yourself and, you know, do the girls like me, don't they, sort of thing. So it sounds childish. It sounds like an 11-year-old. And that's not me mocking you in the slightest. I I have a little boy in there as well. And so you could see it's a trauma response. Mm. Or if that word's too big, we don't have to use it. But so when we have an overreaction, meaning we respond in a way that seems disproportionate to whatever's going on, it's almost always rooted in childhood. Mm. And so you see, because I'm not trying to say look how great I but I look at, if I see a picture of Drake and some girl, I don't care. Now, there are other things that trigger me. Again, I'm not above any of this, but I don't care if Drake has, I have no emotional reaction to that whatsoever, but you do. And so that's telling that there's information in there, right? Mm. Uh huh. And so there's this part of you that got bullied, that the boys didn't like that the girls didn't like for whatever reason at that at that point in your life. And you have to work with that part. You can't destroy it. Mm. Right? You can't conquer it. And that attaches to... That doesn't mean you're doomed to be triggered for the rest of your life and you're going to be this insecure mess who wants girls to be... Th- that, that's not what I'm saying. That's not your destiny. But I'm saying that part of you, you will not be able to rip it out of you and conquer it. Right. What you're going to have to do is develop a healthier relationship with it. And in doing that, it will calm down Mm. and you won't become that boy in certain situations. Right. Yeah. Aaron, would you would you say that it's fair that that it's that we should be, you know, if we recognize sort of that our adolescent self, Mm -hmm. that it's okay to. Also accept that, you know, having a bit of retaining a bit of that in ourselves as adults is okay too. Mm Because, you know, there's, I don't think there's any reason why we should be overly negative or hard on ourselves for having some thoughts like that. Because I think it seems only natural to me. Yeah. Sorry, what was the question? Well, uh, my my question was uh, that, you know, it's very... It's very easy for us to beat ourselves up for yeah. why am I having these these childish negative um, thoughts or, or or we're perceiving these thoughts of like I shouldn't I shouldn't want that I shouldn't yeah. want these you know I shouldn't want that attention in that kind of way I don't I shouldn't want like you know it's it's silly to have all these girls throwing their bras at me but I think it's it seems silly when you look at it from your adult eyes. Right. And what I'm the point I'm trying to make with Mo is he was 11 when these things happen. The way human beings are set up is we have experiences early on in life when we're developing our psyche, our internal world, our beliefs about ourself and the world and, and these sorts of things. And so those experiences affect us mm. and you can't escape that. You absolutely can't escape that. So then we become 28 years old and we go, what the fuck do I care about? Some girl who didn't text me back after one date. I shouldn't care about yeah, this. Yeah, why am I but, so hung up over this little thing? Emotion, I- yeah, these experiences have affected us, right? And we can't get away from that. And so once we own that and become aware of that, we can start to detach from those parts of ourselves. But what I'm saying is what people usually do is hate that aspect of themselves and then so whenever it gets triggered they respond with anxiety or shame or whatever and they get stuck Mm. in 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 that place within themselves Mm. so this is essentially what i'm all i'm really talking about is mindfulness or buddhism essentially right Mm. so in mindfulness or buddhism there's this idea you are not your thoughts you are not your feelings you are not your compulsions you are not your urges they're all yours they're all happening to you Okay, they're not illusions, but you are not them. Okay, what you are is the presence that can observe these things, right? So this sounds very fluffy and abstract, but it's saying be the observer of your experience, not the experience itself. So what the hell does that mean? That means when I come here today and I'm a little bit anxious about doing a podcast, I'm a little bit insecure, you could say, and my mind produces thoughts, what if you fuck up? What if you start talking and you just sound like some arrogant, overly intellectual therapist? All that is happening. I'm not trying to even stop that from happening. But I just observe it from this kind of calm, neutral place. And I go, oh, there's my insecurity. You know, there it is. It showed up. Of course it did. Mm. And it can hang out right here. So I'm not repressing it and I'm not feeding it. And because, and I've practiced this, 
because I have that kind of neutral observer relationship with it, it doesn't grip me. I don't ruminate on it. I, I'm not, I haven't thought once whether this podcast is going well or not, even though at the start I was having all these insecure, not all these, some insecure thoughts, right? So I'm not identified with that part of myself, and so it doesn't grow. It doesn't stick to me. Does that make sense? It's like what we talked about with OCD. 100%. Yeah. And um, so, mo- sorry, I'll just finish this. Yeah, yeah. Going back to what Alex said, mo- most people go, I don't want to think this way. I don't want to think about what other, you know, whatever, whatever it is. And okay, but they do, inevitably. So that's how human beings are set up. And when they do, they get angry or anxious or shameful or whatever. So they react to that. And what I'm saying is, why not? Why not just think that way? Why not just have a thought, a self-conscious thought or an insecure thought? And then just notice that your brain has produced that thought and not do much with it. You don't have to buy it. Hmm. Weird idea, I know. It's weird very abstract. It's weird because no one likes feeling insecure. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. like you said, like you haven't thought once about how this podcast has been going. This episode has been going. I've probably thought about it ten or eleven times. Yeah, and every single time it's come up, I would like to detach from it. But it's stuck. Mm -hmm. It's stuck. And because it's stuck, I'm starting to feel insecure. And then since I'm feeling insecure about it, I'm like, what the fuck, man? I thought I was a secure guy. So it's like, yes, dude. That's the spot. That's the spot you can work on. Right. So that's your reaction to the you. You're choosing everything up to that point, I would say, wasn't a choice. And then that became a choice when you said, what the fuck, dude, I'm supposed to be secure. I've done however many of these things, you know, that's where you can start to play with. See if you can be okay with the fact you're not secure with it, fully secure. Part of you is secure. You're doing fine. Part of you is confident. Part of, part of you's got this and, and, and is focused. There's no denying that. Okay. And then part of you's not. And see if you can be okay with that, whatever the hell that means. Right. So these things, this is where therapy. So, and you'll find this, you probably have found it Mm -hmm. because you get to these point with people when you're talking about their internal world and language stops working. What do I mean by that exactly? Okay. So let's say you need to learn to ride a bike. How do you ride a bike? Someone gives you some instructions and they say, put your hands on the handlebars, put your feet on the pedal, start pedaling. It's like, okay, cool. Got it. But you don't know how to ride a bike. And so you take those instructions and you get on the bike and you fall off. Okay? And then you get back on and you fall off the other way. And then as you fall off, you start to get a feel for it. And you start to get a hang hang of it. And so your inability, you're screwing up. You're not getting it ultimately leads to you getting it. And so with this mindfulness stuff, we're talking, it's the same thing. I can't literally tell you how to let go of the part of your insecurity, Mm, right? I can point you to different places within yourself. And then how you learn to be okay with the part of you that's insecure is ultimately by not being able to do it, to kind of doing it, to doing a podcast with Aaron and say, okay, I'm going to try to not worry about it. And then a part of you does and you say, okay, that's fine. And, And that's you falling off the bike to get a feel for it. But what it comes back to is you just keep noticing these aspects of your psyche working within yourself and you keep seeing if you can be okay with them. Mm. If you can truly be okay that you were bullied when you were 11, okay, and now you're 28 and when you do things where the cameras are on and people are going to see and people are going to judge you, people are going to watch this and make judgments on me and you, whether we're cool, whether we're smart, whether we're dumb, whatever, all that's going to go on. It's you see if you can be okay with that there's part of you that cares about that. And if you can truly be okay with that, that part will start to calm down. 
or you won't be it. You won't become identified with it. You mm. won't be absorbed in it. You'll be this other thing, this other presence that's just observing it, mm. right? I also want to say what's interesting is, and I see this a lot, I've seen it myself, but people put themselves in a situation a lot of times to bring up the very things they're terrified of, right? So let's say yourself, you got bullied, do people like me? How do I look? Do I seem cool? And then you do a podcast yeah. <laughs> and put yourself yeah, you out there. You said that last episode right? too. Yeah. And so and I, it's like there's this force working with, I don't even know if it's a conscious thing, that, that puts them in places that are going to force them to address the things they need to address. Right. I see that in relationships too. It's like people are drawn to partners that are awful for them. Maybe not awful, but that are going to trigger all the stuff that needs to be transcended within themselves. It's very weird. Wow. Do you think you would just avoid all putting yourself out there? You think you wouldn't have a podcast? You know, mm. you'd have your little circle and you never put yourself out there. You'd delete social media. You wouldn't put yourself in a situation to be judged or potentially bullied. We could post this. Some troll could come on and, and start insulting well, they us. Will. Right? They always do. Okay. Right? And so that's so interesting, mm. you know. W would you and say that, uh, maybe I'm overanalyzing, but would you say that Mo is confronting his own anxiety and his own insecurities by actually like, doing something yes. like this in public, putting himself on yes, the front line. Yes, a hundred percent. That's exactly that's the exact point I'm trying to make. I, I think whether you're conscious of that or not, I see this in people. They do it. It's fascinating. What they're terrified of, there's something in them that resists it and runs away from it. And then there's this other force that kind of brings them towards mm. it, you know? You know what's weird though, man? No matter, I feel like I mean you hear this with, with celebrities all the time and you know, celebrities that are that are you know, that I've dealt with addiction and, and depression. And it's almost like I, I just finished the Matthew Perry book. The oh, memoir, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because you know, I was a big Friends fan, big yeah. Chandler fan. That hit me really hard. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I had a, we had an episode on it. I mean, Chandler was like, for guys, man, I think Chandler he, was like the was most relatable. The perf yes. He was the perfect guy in his late 20s early 30s somewhat good looking but low self esteem family issues i think his dad uh, well, they his got a divorce like, or something yeah, yeah, his, yeah. and he had a what i would say is a disorganized attachment style so both an anxious and an avoidant yeah. where he was insecure and neurotic and then he would also avoid right. there's an episode where he's i forget what it is but some it's this might be seinfeld actually i think it's friends though where He's getting angry at himself because he always finds something wrong with the woman. Yep. And then he's sitting there and she's talking and he, he, she has a big head. <laughs> I love that scene. That was the episode it's so where relatable. When Mr. Heckles died and right. it was just yes. like, he was just so picky on everything, yeah. like big gums. Yeah. Doesn't say this word correctly. But, or, you yeah. know, in, in Adlerian psychology, there's this idea of purposeful behavior. And so every behavior has a purpose. There's always a payoff. Being in an abusive, toxic relationship, there's a payoff in there somewhere. And so it's like being picky, okay, fixating, finding something wrong with someone you're, you're dating. What's the payoff to that? Well, you don't, you don't find yourself in a relationship. What's the payoff to that? You don't get rejected. You don't be whatever these sorts of things, right. right? So all these little neurotic behaviors people do, there's a payoff in them somewhere. Anyways, right. I interrupted you. Sorry. No, I mean, the point I was trying to get at is um, throughout the book, man, like it was so fascinating to hear him talk about how he was on top of the world. Like he mm -hmm. had millions and millions of people around the world just adoring him, looking up to him, all these women throwing at him, but he just still felt empty like he still felt like he was strive he was he need he still needed that validation yeah all the time yeah and i don't know i just feel like even with like i feel like with a lot of men i think no matter how much they do accomplish it's just especially with the validation and the the validation from women. I think yeah. that's a big part. With yeah. Guys that oh, guys yeah. don't really look into. Like, what's that about? Like, what your thoughts around men and women and men wanting that approval and not getting it and getting it from some and then not getting it from some 
others and then really striving to get it from those that yeah. don't want to give it to them like what is that whole thing i think part of it's obviously evolutionary we've evolved to care what women, men have evolved to care what women think i think a lot of times like we talked about we've experiences at a young age that make us feel not good about ourselves that make us feel shame and then later on in life we use our romantic relationships to compensate for that or to numb that feeling to make us feel good about ourselves. And so what I think a lot of men do is they objectify women to some degree. They look at the woman and she says, and they think, whether they think this consciously or not, they think, if I can get her, if I can possess her, if I can conquer her, I will feel good about myself. And then, obviously, that relationship fails because they're not looking at a human being. They're looking at an object or, or some tool they're going to use to make them feel better about mm-hmm. themselves. And so the relationship fails, which reinforces their shame or their feeling as a worthlessness, right? So the woman rejects them, whatever happens, and then they feel even worse about themselves. And so they get stuck in this cycle of trying to use women to prop themselves up or to feel good, not being able to relate to them on a human level, getting rejected, and feeling bad about themselves mm-hmm. all over again. I don't know if I answered I mean, your it's, question. It's evolution, or not. Like when you say evolutionary, it's evolutionary on the on the standpoint of, you know, we we like mm-hmm. to be wanted. But, we like but, we like to know that we are admired and yeah. wanted by others, yeah. specifically women. Yeah, a hundred percent. And but again, it's you are not your thoughts, your feelings, your desires. You're you're the observer. And so I would bring it back to: Can you be okay with that? There's a part of me that cares what women thinks about me too, right? And so what do I do with that? And the answer is not much. You just notice that that's part of your So you humanity. just sit with it. Like you're just like, yeah, I um, care yeah, about women I wish, think about I wish, women. I wish I could give you a more complicated no, answer, I, but that's that's the the foundation for a lot of this stuff. It's like you care what women think about you. It's like, okay. It's uh, whether you like that or not, you're stuck with that reality. And so when that pops up, you can either say, oh, my God, I'm so pathetic or, or fuck, no, don't care, don't care, yeah. which just, just makes you care. You know, there's no one who cares more than someone shouting that they don't care. Right. Otherwise, why would you be talking about it? Right. Right. And so you notice it. You say, hello. There it is. And then you can make a conscious choice of how you want to handle the situation. Right. And so. All I'm saying is don't fight your experience. You get triggered, you get anxious, you get insecure, you think, oh my God, what does that girl think about me? Did I, you know, don't fight any of it. Allow all of it and you can detach from these things. But Mm. it doesn't eliminate them, right? Just observing it isn't going to eliminate the thought, I wonder what that girl thought of me or what. Hmm. What are you thinking when I say these things? To be honest, right now I'm kind of like in this like I wouldn't say I'm overwhelmed. I'm I would say that I'm I'm also very cons- I'm wor- I'm 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 worried about what you're thinking of this episode. Like that's really? another thing. That's another thing yeah. about me too, like especially with this podcasting and having guests on. I'm always always second guessing what uh-huh. the guess is thinking and so you but, know again i haven't th- i'm having a great time my hunch is it's way later than i is that a right an hour and 15 yes yeah, so, yeah, that's sorry. crazy that's crazy do you want to bring up the oce thing well, too later what, i want to say one more yeah. thing if you don't mind yeah um so there's two parts to it so let's say there's a young man who's very insecure around women and he cares a lot what they think about him and these sorts of things so part of it is is just allowing himself to feel that way or to think those things. Another part of it's behavioral, right? And so the things you do matter. And so the way you get o- one of the ways you get over care, you know, this neurotic part of you that cares too much about what women think is to develop a healthy relationship with a woman. You get what I'm saying? You you need to gather real life experiences in order to calm some of these things too. So part of it is being mindful, allowing these experiences. You need a podcast to go wrong, which I'm sure you've had, mm-hmm. and, and, and to you, ha- have you, people bully or to make fun of you. And you need to sit there and feel whatever comes up, and then you need to get up the next day. 
get on with your life. These yeah. sort that's uh, that's part of it too, mm. right? But so it's you just, know, it, I'm having a good time, and I haven't thought once about anything other than just thanks, man. This conversation, and yeah, you it, it, it's you, you put yourself in the situations, and you're good at it, and yet you it's have just this, this like ongoing judgment, man. I think like one of the things that really gets to me is like these like public perceptions of what of how things should be going and what mm -hmm. what should be happening or because one of the things like for example like a little small example i was watching something and some guy was saying like after the 50th episode on your podcast like the amount of times you get anxious and the amount of times you flop quote unquote flop during an episode as a host has to tremendously go down so Right at episode fifty one. Now I'm like, okay, now I have to be dialed in at all times. Yeah, but I also, you know, I right? also so say like, part of your charm is that you open up and you express how you're not comfortable, and that leads us, to, you know, me in particular, it leads us to a conversation about anxiety, and we can draw on our real life experiences to have these conversations that might might resonate with people, might find interesting, might not, sort of mm -hmm. thing. Right. I hope people and do. So, like, I don't want people to. Obviously, no one. Like, as a host, like, I don't want anyone to look at me and be like, "Well, Mo had a tr had trouble f figuring out what to say or getting the words out." Like, oh, I don't. Man, Theo Vaughn does that all. You watch Theo Vaughn. No, Theo, I love Theo Vaughn. He yeah. does that all the time. But you <laughs> can see, he just stops and goes, "What should we talk about?" And goes, "Hmm," and then we'll ask some stupid question. Right. Like, oh, no. Is he? So would you say Theo Vaughn is at the point where he's so comfortable with that feeling of? damn, what am I going to say here? Or that insecurity of me being a bad host and be like, okay, I'm okay with no, that. No, I don't. I think I, I listen to him quite a bit. He talks a lot. He's always kind of, or quite often quite self-deprecating and insecure. Really? I think he's funny. People, I think he's People both. love I think, the old I think like people he, can be a contradiction. I think he's incredibly aloof and secure and whatnot. And then you see this little boy pop up that talks about his mom and, you know, and he gets he gets anxious and, and there's a lot of times where he'll say something, then he'll kind of apologize and want to really make sure he didn't offend the guests sort of thing. Right. Which to me seems more than him just being polite, which seems like right. some sort of neuroticism. One thing, one thing I do a lot, and I did this with you during this episode, is I keep saying, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this. I don't know if you would agree as if like I'm trying to like prep you for something that might offend you or make you mm -hmm. overthink, yeah, and that right? Like I wouldn't, and I, that's the, that's the fear that I have. I don't want, I don't want you as a guest to feel uncomfortable or mm -hmm. feel like you're overthinking what you want to say. Can right. I, can yeah. I step right? Like there's just yeah. a lot of like that, like, fuck, like is Aaron having a good time? Am I being a good coach? <laughs> I'm not laughing at I, you. No, I, sorry, Alex wants to say Mo, something. Mo, I think you're, I think you're yeah. just trying to, I think Mo is just trying to, prompt you as a host to try to keep the conversation yeah. flowing he's seen i don't think he sees that uh but i think he um he's obviously being particularly hard on himself here but, but I I, what, as an observer just doing things on the back end behind the scenes i just see someone trying to keep the guest engaged mm -hmm. i don't see anything that he's doing as a negative thing and um you know, I, I when we first started working together, because we're we've done almost seventy nice. episodes yeah. of this show together. What, that the first ten episodes, I remember, like he's changed. He's a, a lot. He's a lot more comfortable now. And I remember that for the first ten episodes, every time he would get here, he just the anxiety levels were way higher. Yeah, he would, he would be pacing. He would be breathing. <laughs> <hungry. sighs> uh <-huh>. Okay. <sighs> Let's do this, right? And he doesn't do that anymore. Yeah. He just comes in now and he's like, all right, let's I have a good time. I think people change and then they don't really notice they've changed, you know? Yeah. So he might not even notice that. But, you know, I would also say that's just something he had to go through. Absolutely. That was part of his process and he's still in a process and I'm still in a process and so are you sort of thing. And so part of the process that he needs to go through is to get really anxious about doing podcasts and to come here and to be 7 out of 10 anxious and to have his heart beating and to sit there and to spend the whole time worrying what other people think and then for it to go either okay or not okay. And that's part of the process at which it. he gets to the point of where he's at right now. But, you know, 
Um, and I hate the fact that like we're talking a lot about me. No, right now. I and like I, it. So. And I that's but that's another fucking thing that it's like okay, well, everyone, people are gonna listen. He's like Jesus, Mo is so fucking self entitled. That's just incredible. It's about incredible. It. That's how you interpret it. Or and maybe, I don't want you to be like, damn, like you know, I'm the guest, Aaron. That and we're talking about Moses. Just, just for to God give you some feedback, time. though, not for a single second has a thought. And I would, I don't know if I'd tell you or not, but <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't deny it, it. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Not for a second has any thought like I, I've not been sitting here thinking, damn, most. So that's in your head. You're projecting, right? You're seeing your experience through your own bias filtered lens. But, you know, a couple thoughts for me. I think. The qualities that are best about people, they usually don't really, they don't see in themselves because they're so embodied. So that applies to Larry. I don't think Larry knows why he's a great therapist. I think he has a lot of smart things to say and he's got a PhD in philosophy and he knows his shit. Don't get me wrong. But I don't think Larry knows why he's so great. Like I've referred a lot of people to Larry and everyone comes back with like, wow, like thank you for letting me meet that guy sort of thing. So he's... He embodies it's patience or it's it's like complete lack of judgment or something. I don't think he knows he's doing it. I think it's just so embodied that it just is him. I think you, you're really good at what you're doing, doing these podcasts sort of thing. But it makes sense. You want to give yourself credit because what makes you good is probably just very natural to you that you don't sit there thinking that you're doing the things you're doing. This other I this quote so. I want to share. Um, I, I don't remember where I heard it, but it said, your brain has not evolved to make you happy. Your brain has evolved to keep you alive. Okay, so it's a survival thing. And so it fixates on what we consider to be our flaws, our weaknesses, and our vulnerabilities sort of thing. It pays more attention to those things, right, than it does our good qualities sort of thing. So you're sitting there. I'm having a wonderful time. I'm delighted you, you two invited me here today. I think it's going well but i don't know i'll have to listen to it afterwards sort of thing right and you're sitting there and your brain is fixated on what could be going wrong what i might be thinking negatively about you you know these sorts of things and so it pays attention to where we're vulnerable and that's happening for you and that's so it's not ideal but that's how the brain is kind of wired goddamn brain works yeah but again you don't have to be those thoughts Mm. You can have them without being them. I know that sounds weird and it doesn't make complete sense. You can think, oh shit, am I talking about myself too much? Is Aaron sitting there thinking I'm whatever without fuel feeding that, without getting swept up in it, right? And then the emotion behind, when you get good at that, whatever good means, the emotion behind that thought starts to calm down. Right? Like I said, I had insecure type thoughts prior to doing this when I sat down. But there was very little emotional reaction to those thoughts. I didn't feel super insecure or anxious, even though my brain was producing the thoughts. Is this going to go well? Blah, blah, blah. Like physiologically, yeah. you didn't have the yeah. symptoms of... Yeah. And that's what people with OCD are trying to do, right? Mm. They're trying to think about washing their hands 50 times without and detach from the compulsion or the feeling that I have to wash my hands 50 times. And so it's a very sneaky, subtle, abstract skill. And it's what the things we're talking about here, they're the opposite than willpower. It's not the same thing as pushing out that 10th rep on the bench press, even though Mm. your brain is telling you not to. It's not about conquering it or willing through it. It's a more feminine, softer approach. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. The tricky thing with OCD, and this is the last thing I'll bring up, but the scary thing about OCD is, for ex- like if, like the last guest we had on Bradley, mm-hmm. one of his tendencies with his OCD was what he said was when he was driving, when he would be driving anywhere, he would have this like extreme irrational fear that he hurt someone mm-hmm. on the way yeah. to wherever he was going. Yeah. So he would have to drive back yeah. and check if he hurt anyone. Yeah, Like he would have to literally, like he would have to stop in his way yeah, path, yeah. Make, 
you turn, yeah, go back to wherever he came from or the same route he came from, and then really like and he, go through that whole process just to give himself an ease of mind. Yeah. Now, the th- tricky thing and the scary thing about OCD is, let's say he did actually hit someone on the way to wherever he was going, and he did hurt someone on the way accidentally. That's just reaffirming his OCD, and it's like, see, I told you. Mm-hmm. That's where OCD gets like, holy shit, like this could, this could get real, real quick, oh, and yeah. then, and then it's a whole different animal. The you're thing fighting. with OCD is you'd want to try and not pay attention to the content of what you think. Okay, the con- the specifics of your thought don't matter. All it is is your thought. You 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 think something you don't want to think which creates a discomfort in you, emotional and psychological discomfort. And then you find a behavior, pulling a U-turn, going to check, that regulates that discomfort. And then so a circuit in your brain is formed, and you feel as though you have to do the behavior to get rid of the emotional and psychological discomfort. And that's the trap. What you need to do is be able to regulate the psychological and emotional discomfort without doing the thing that gets you there. But, you know, I had a client once, and... He would be driving his car and his brain would think, what if I just swerve to the other lane and hit these people? Or he would be petting his cat and he'd think, what if I just threw this cat off the 30th floor apartment? <laughs> or he'd have, no, no, it goes yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. Or he'd have scissors. Yeah. He'd think, what if I just cut my dick off with these scissors, right? So none of these thoughts yeah. make sense. No. But his brain produces basically the last thought you would want to have, right? It produces this crazy, dangerous thought you know, it's like I'll think of the worst thing that could possibly happen at this moment sort of thing or the worst thing I could do. Let's tease with that thought a little bit. Yeah. Just... Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. And then he so badly doesn't want to think these way, this way that he's priming his brain to produce these thoughts. You know, he so badly doesn't want to think about throwing his cat off the 30th floor. This, every time he looks at that cat, his brain produces that thought because it's primed and ready to go. You know, dude, thank you for coming on. Oh, again. pleasure. This has been pleasure. Awesome. And I. I yeah, go ahead. I, I, in advance, I apologize if I don't feel like if I seem off or I don't even know why I'm apologizing. Exactly. That's exactly right. Right. You have nothing to apologize Jesus. for. But not so that, 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 G, that's what you need to work with. Don't apologize or don't get upset. What am I trying to say? Don't, you're, don't get you're, ups- yeah. There's a little boy in there or there's a part of you that feels the need to apologize when he doesn't want to. You notice yourself doing it, you go, oh, fuck. Right? Yeah. That's where you can intervene. Now, it's easy for me to say because I'm not the one doing it. But for you, it's like, see if you can be okay that there's a part of you that feels the need to apologize when you don't have to. Given your life experiences, that makes sense. Okay? And, um, you know, what stood out for me, which I really enjoyed talking about, was your projections onto me. Okay? We all live in our own mind and we project outwards onto the world. And some of it is an accurate reflection. A lot of it is just a reflection of what our biases, our traumas, our experiences. And stuff. You can start to play with that in your podcast, right? Is uh, like there's this thing in therapy. I said I have to go now. I'm going to talk for 10 more minutes, but it's called the here and now. Okay. And so a relationship forms between the client and the therapist. And the things the client is struggling with outside of therapy in their relationships, whether it's with their partner or their mom or their dad or their friends, pops up in their dynamic with the therapist, right? Because it's no different. It's a human relationship. And so that stuff follows them into therapy. And so if someone's terrified of being rejected and on high alert for that, they're going to interpret the things their therapist does as rejection, as possible rejection. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Anyways, I don't really know where I'm going with this rant. That stuff popped up with us today. And you have to, you don't have to do anything. But, <laughs> you know, try yeah, you're not. You're naturally to, funny guy. Has anyone told you that? I'm saying, try not to hate it. It's interesting. It's interesting. Aaron could was not thinking that in the slightest. And my mind is, is, is worrying about this and that. Okay. That's interesting. And if you can get interested with that as opposed to hating that you do that, you're in a better place to start to detach from, from that. But yeah, okay. It's all practice. Okay. Guess, yeah. yeah, let's call it there. I Aaron Johnstone, man. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, dude. you bet, buddy. Round two. 
we'll do this again sometime absolutely again. This will absolutely be an thing. Fucking... thanks for having me guys yeah you bet thanks alex i like what you guys are doing